Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. We don't get nearly as upset when something happens to somebody else as we do if it happens to us. If it happens to somebody else, we give them a speech about how they should trust God. If it happens to us, well, I don't understand how this could happen to me. Why? It's a spirit that we are so great that we should never have that kind of thing happen to us. Well, I want to talk to you this morning about the characteristics of humility. <laughs> I'll let you think about that a minute. The characteristics of humility. It's actually, I believe, the number one virtue, the number one Christian virtue that we need to develop. Humility is one of the first things that Christ says about himself. In Matthew chapter 11, when he says, all that are weary and overburdened, that are laboring, come unto me, and you'll find rest for your souls. Learn of me, he says. Learn of me, for I am humble. <laughs> Then he goes on to say, gentle, meek, and lowly, not harsh, hard, sharp, and pressing. We see all those other character traits that are so beautiful. Gentleness is so beautiful. Meekness is so beautiful. I hate to be around people that are harsh and hard and sharp and pressing. And you can never please them, and enough is never enough. I used to be one of those kind of people. I grew up in a home with a father who was like that. It's terrible to be around people that you can never keep them happy. Harsh, hard, sharp, pressing people. Jesus said, I'm not like that. I'm gentle, meek, lowly, loving, forgiving. But he starts off by saying, learn of me, for I am humble. Now, I think it might be safe to say that pretty much all sin issues out of the one sin of pride. Pride really is an independent spirit that wants to do its own thing with no, having to come under no authority, with no direction from anyone else. Humility means freedom from pride and arrogance, a modest estimation of your own worth. Doesn't mean you think lowly of yourself, but it means that you are very careful not to think more highly of yourselves than you ought to. In other words, you don't think you're better than anybody else, and you don't think that somehow you on your own got the ability to do what you're able to do, you have to realize that anything you can do well is a gift from God and it comes as a blessing from Him. Therefore, the more you're able to do, the more talented you are, the more humble you should become. It should amaze you that God would put those gifts in you. It should amaze you that God would enable you to do anything. But what we see is the exact opposite. It seems like the more that people can do, the more haughty and full of themselves they become, and the more they look down on other people. Now, the Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, he will exalt you. So this is something that we can learn about, and we can actually do. I will say, if we don't learn to humble ourselves, God will do it for us through humiliation. And humbling ourselves is much easier than having God do it for you. Some of you, I'm sure, know exactly what I mean. Pride is defined as an inordinate measure of self-esteem, an unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority in talents, beauty, wealth, accomplishment, rank, or elevation in office, which manifests itself. Now, here's the main problem with pride. I want you to get this. Which manifests itself in lofty airs, distancing ourselves from others and often being contemptuous of others. It causes insolent and rude treatment of others while it causes an elevation and a lifting up of ourselves. The biggest problem, well, the two biggest problems I see with pride, number one is that we think we don't need God. And number two, we think that we can mistreat other people. And I want to tell you today that how we treat people is a very personal thing to God. Jesus is definitely a people person. 
He's all about people. He likes people. He likes to lift up the lowly and the downtrodden. He likes to help the poor and the needy, the widows and the orphans. And he does not take it kindly when any person in a position of authority mistreats somebody else just because they think that they're able to. Humility is extremely important because the Bible says it always comes before honor and promotion. Now it's true, people can finagle around in the flesh and maybe get themselves promoted to some degree out in the world. But that kind of promotion you can never be happy with. It never comes with joy. It only comes with pressure. All you have to see is all the famous people in the world that have promoted themselves and what pressure they have and the suicide rate and the, the drugs and the alcohol and the, and the messed up dysfunctional lives. But true promotion comes from God. True promotion and lifting up comes from God. And we better hope that we don't put ourselves somewhere, but that we know how to wait on God to promote us. Because when you put yourself, you have to keep yourself. When God puts you, then He keeps you. Somebody with humility can wait on God to do what needs to be done. They don't have to get in the flesh and start trying to make it happen themselves. True humility brings honor and promotion. God hates pride according to Proverbs 6. The Bible lists seven things that he hates. Well, six that he hates and one that is an abomination, which happens to be strife. God absolutely, it's an abomination to him when we have a strifeful, contentious spirit and we're always stirring up trouble among people rather than trying to get along. But there's six things listed that he hates and one of those things is pride. Several of the others have to do with our mouth and the way that we talk. A person that has a pride problem almost always talks too much and almost always at the wrong time. We need to learn about humility. We need to learn how to recognize pride and we need to learn how to recognize humility. I met for just a moment with one of the local pastors this morning that's going to be going to Malawi, Africa with us and helping in an outreach to that nation. And my son had told me what a great church he had here and he even told me approximately how big it was and all the things that this couple's doing. And, and so when I met them this morning, I said, well, I understand you have uh, quite an awesome, phenomenal church here. And I could tell immediately that the man had humility because he didn't say, oh, yes, we have seven, seven services a week and they're all full and packed out and no place to park and yada, yada, yada. He said, well, we're growing. I love that. I absolutely love that. See, that's the kind of people that I'd like to work with. Sometimes we get into bragging. We need to be very careful about bragging. It's amazing how people in ministry are into numbers. We count everything. How many people were there? How much was this? How much was that? How many were those? How many was something else? I don't think Jesus did that. Amen? Come on now, don't look at me like that. Pride goes before destruction. Every time you see destruction, pride has gone before that destruction. Very few people, very few people can be exalted, become famous, and be promoted by God and handle it well. Very few. That's one of the reasons why Paul said, do not put a new convert in a place of leadership. Because if you do, you're just really giving him a problem because you're giving him something that he does not yet have the maturity to know how to handle. And you're giving yourself a problem because you're going to have to deal with the stupid stuff he does. Sometimes we're so desperate for people to help us in ministry or even in business that the minute you see that somebody has a little talent, you want to put them in a position. But we need to make sure that people have character. There's a lot of people that have a gift that will take them somewhere, but not enough character to keep them there once they get there. I'm tired of seeing shooting stars who fall faster than they rose and end up giving Christianity a bad name. 
Don't despise that they have small beginnings. And don't be in too big a hurry to try to get on the platform somewhere. Or to get your name on the office door at work. Or to have somebody call you the boss or the leader or whatever. So many people who come to church, they bring their worldliness into church. And right away they want to perform for somebody. If you really want to be in ministry, it does not have to be on a platform. Nor should that necessarily be what you're seeking. God will choose who he puts where. And if he puts you there, then be there with humility and do what he asks you to do. But if he asks you to clean the toilet, then be just as happy to do that. Otherwise, we do not have a servant's attitude. We're not going to get rewarded for whether we did what the world would call this great thing or that great thing. Our reward is going to come because individually we obeyed God and we're willing to do what He asked us to do no matter how the world saw that or what they felt about it. Amen? Humility is beautiful. It's probably the hardest virtue to come by. I think that one and patience are probably the two hardest to come by. And really the truth is, is all impatience is a manifestation of pride. If I can't stand to wait on anything, then it's because I think I. I'm too important to wait. And I should be getting what I want right away. Amen? <laughs> and so we have to deal with these issues in our life. This might, you know, this may not be a message where you'll do a lot of shouting, but if you'll listen to it, it will help you in your life. Because whatever it is you want from God, you're going to have to humble yourself and wait on Him and learn to lean on him and to need him before he's going to give it to you. And after he does give it to you, you better make sure that you keep an even more humble attitude and be the most amazed of all people that God is using you. Amen? Actually, the Bible says, I love what 1 Timothy 3, 6 says about this new convert. I just really have to read this to you because it's really funny in the Amplified. He must not be a new convert. Or he may develop a beclouded and a stupid state of mind as a result of pride. He may be blinded by conceit and, and <laughs> fall into the condemnation that the devil once did. It goes on to say that he may become stupefied with pride. Furthermore, no, no, that's going into the wrong thing. But Sometimes if we have a proud and a haughty attitude, it just makes us act stupid, doesn't it? Amen? There's all kinds of leaders in the Bible that became losers. There's nothing worse to me than a leader who becomes a loser. Leadership is a responsibility of any kind. Parents, you have a great responsibility to lead your children in humility. When you're wrong, admit to them that you're wrong. If you make an accusation against them and find out you were wrong, go back and tell them, I was wrong. One of the greatest ways to humble yourself is get very comfortable with saying, I was wrong. Let me tell you something, being right is highly overrated. It's amazing how we behave just to feel like we're right. And then what's it all worth in the end anyway? As a parent, Always show humility to your children. If you're in any kind of a position of authority, lead people with all humility. Be very careful about bragging and boasting. First Samuel, we see that Saul was a leader who started out good. God anointed him to be king. But then he had his kingdom taken away from him because he had a haughty attitude that caused him to disobey God. He did not do what God asked him to do. You see, a person who has humility has a reverential fear of God. You're not going to do what you know God doesn't want you to do because you know that he's God and you're not. And so you have not a wrong fear of God, but a reverential fear that causes you not to do a little bit of what God said and a little bit of what you want. And that's what Saul did. He altered what God had told him to do and he changed it just a little bit and thought his idea was a little bit better than God's. How do we know that Saul had a haughty and a prideful spirit? Because in 1 Samuel 15, 12, it says, Saul set up a monument to himself. 
In other words, he built a statue of himself. Look how great Saul is. In 1 Samuel 17, 15, 17, when he was confronted by the prophet Samuel, well, what have I done wrong, he said. See, your mind can become clouded with pride. Pride is deceitful. And we can be doing all kinds of wrong things and behaving in all kinds of wrong ways, and yet all we see is what everybody else is doing wrong, and we don't see anything at all wrong with us. Judgment comes out of pride. Complaining comes out of pride. All complaining comes from pride. I should not be inconvenienced. I should not be made to be uncomfortable. Aren't we having fun today? Isn't this good? You all kind of look like you're shocked. Like, Come on. It's so easy to go to one of these third world countries and be tempted to complain about the conditions. But then I can remember that not everybody gets to go. And God's allowed me to go. And I'm getting to carry the gospel, the truth, of the gospel of Jesus Christ to these nations who are living in darkness. And the little bit of inconvenience that I go through to do that, I should count a privilege and not ever get into murmuring and complaining. But you know what? I've got a flesh like everybody else, and I have to remind myself of these things just like you're going to have to remind yourself of things. I have to say things to me like, Joyce, that is none of your business. What they are doing is none of your business, and you do not need to have an opinion. <laughs> Come on. Because it's just too easy. Well, I think. Well, I think. Well, I think. Well, let me tell you what I think. Well, you know what? Nobody cares what you think. <laughs> don't ever give anybody your opinion unless they ask you. And then half the time they don't really want it. They just want to see if you'll agree with them. <laughs> Amen? Well, I think. Well, I think. Well, I think. Well, I think. It's amazing how we want to run everybody else's lives. So Samuel said to Saul, when you were small in your own sight, God lifted you up and promoted you. So you see, he had a right attitude, and that a humble attitude brought promotion and honor into his life, but then it wasn't very long at all, and he built a monument to himself. I read something a long time ago that I think is very important. This writer said, it is yet to be seen what God could do through a man or a woman who would give him all of the glory. We have not yet even begun to see the limit of what God could do through a person who would be willing to give him all the glory and keep a humble attitude. Now, it's impossible to have a humble man without a humble mind. Humility has a lot to do with how we think in our own private think time. You have to be very careful about those times. Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel was another king who started out right, and it only took him 12 months to get in the biggest mess you've ever seen. 12 months. I want to look at Daniel chapter 4 for just a minute because I want you to see this, how quick it can happen. When God promotes you in any way, you get a pay raise, you get a promotion at work, Whatever happens, you need to be sure that you're aggressively thanking God and telling Him, I know I don't deserve anything, but I'm grateful that you've given it to me. Daniel chapter 4, the first five verses, I love, Nebuchadnezzar the king to all people, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth. May peace be multiplied to you. The king said, it seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God had performed toward me. How great are his signs? How mighty are his wonders? His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. How many of you notice who's getting the glory right here? God is, right? And his dominion is from everlasting to everlasting. And I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, and I was prospering in my palace. I love that. As long as he had the right attitude, and he was giving God the glory, he was at rest, he was at peace, and he was prospering. 
God will be very happy to give you more and more and more if you handle what you have well. This whole giving thing, I think, is part of a humble lifestyle. I think when God has blessed us, and we don't care anything about people who have less than we do, there's an attitude problem there. The Spirit of God in us demands that we care about those that are less fortunate than we are. And if we don't, then there's a problem with our Christianity, or as one man has written in his book, there's a hole in the gospel. You know that pride was Lucifer's problem. I, 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 I. We saw last night that it was Solomon's problem. For myself, for myself, for myself, for myself. So Nebuchadnezzar started out right, but if you look at verse 29, only, tw only 29 verses took him to get in trouble. At the end of 12 months, 12 months, he was walking in the royal palace of Babylon, and the king said, is not this the great Babylon that I have built? <laughs> Twelve months ago, it was all God. Now it's all him. I built it as my royal residence and the seat of government. By the might of my power, I built it. And for the honor and the glory of my majesty, I've done it. Well, while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. <laughs> well, hello. God would love to bless us more if we can show that we can handle it. Amen? And then the good news is, is that we can recover. He ended up living like an animal for seven years. His hair grew long, got all matted, and his fingernails grew long, and he was out just out in the fields running around. He just lost his mind. But then in verse 35, or verse 34, it says, At the end of the days, I lifted up my eyes, and my understanding of the right use of my mind came back to me. Verse 35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What are you doing? Now Nebuchadnezzar is getting a right view of God again. God is sovereign. He can do what he wants to, when he wants to, anywhere he wants to, anytime he wants to, to anybody he wants to, and it's none of anybody's business. <laughs> we need to just forget all the trying to figure God out. Oh, why, God, why? Why me? Why me? Well, why not you? We don't get nearly as upset when something happens to somebody else as we do if it happens to us. If it happens to somebody else, we give them a speech about how they should trust God. If it happens to us, well, I don't understand how this could happen to me. Why? It's a spirit that we are so great that we should never have that kind of thing happen to us. Five times in Isaiah 14, Lucifer said, I will exalt my throne above the throne of God. I will be like God. I will, I will, I will, I will. And God said, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to be cast down and destroyed. God will not share his glory with anybody. He will not put up with a haughty spirit. We need to learn more and more in this area. Well, I actually believe that humility is one of the number one Christian virtues that we should seek. You know, I like to read a good book on humility at least once a year. It just helps me to remember that I'm nothing in myself, but I can be everything in Christ. You know, the Bible talks about confidence, and it says, put no confidence in the flesh. It really gets into an area of pride if I think that I can do it and I don't need any help. But when I lean on God and I'm confident in Him, then I'm free.